Greetings, folks. As you can probably guess, today's lecture is going to be on the historical side. I've also thrown up a little bit of international phonetic alphabet for you to try to decipher, so I'm going to pause here for a few seconds just to give you some time to try to read some words rather than just isolated sounds in the IPA, which, as I said, I'll be using with increasing regularity from here on in. Well, that was fun. Today, of course, I'll be giving you a general introduction to the spread of English. So we're now entering the period where English moves from being merely a local language to being a global language. It's an interesting story and a politically charged story, and I'll be doing my best to address both the linguistic and the political issues. As far as the political and technological innovations that made the colonial endeavor coming out of Europe possible, we discussed those in the introduction to early modernity, so it's time to move on from there and consider why a country might want to set up a colonial empire or at least embark on a venture that will eventually morph into a colonial empire. And the most obvious one is pretty clearly wealth. And the first really obvious element of wealth that a nascent colonial power is going to have its eye on is land, along with such items as fish, wood, fur, and gold. That is, natural resources. For example, an early report from the Grand Banks off of Newfoundland addressed to Queen Elizabeth I claimed that there were enough fish in those waters to feed England for 500 years. And as for wood, at least where England was concerned, they didn't really have much because they had, by the beginnings of early modernity, cut down most of their forests. And as for gold, well, everybody always seems to want that stuff, don't they? Of course, there are lots of different ways to get gold, and in the first wave of colonization, particularly of South America and Mesoamerica, the Spanish in particular stole tons and tons, literally shiploads, of gold treasures worked with great craftsmanship from the First Nations of the lands that they were stealing to be melted down and made into coins. In probably the most concrete conversion of culture into money imaginable, or at least maybe the second most. But of course, the world in which early colonialism emerged was intensely competitive. That is, once that train got rolling, there were only so many directions it could actually go in. The European powers were in competition against each other, and if one power had a sudden uptick in wealth and influence, it would reflect negatively, it would affect negatively their rival powers. So once the first countries, Spain and Portugal, turned their gaze and their reach outward, other countries, if they wanted to avoid effectively being dominated by those, had to follow suit or face an existential crisis, such as the crisis that England faced and was able to stave off in 1588 against a Spain with almost a century of colonial wealth gathering behind it and colonial power behind it. And I think it's no accident that after the sinking of the Spanish Armada, England becomes much more serious about exploring and exploiting the various lands that were gradually falling within its reach. But of course, the early empires were not merely military empires. In fact, they weren't even primarily military empires. They were largely trading empires. There's stuff out there in the world that you want and just can't take. And a number of the early colonial outposts were set up to do trade. That is, we're also entering the age of mercantilism, an early version of capitalism in which wealth and power is more and more focused on really what we now call the middle class, not the landed aristocracy, but people who are able to 
own and move and transfer property relatively quickly and at a profit. Of course, one of the most sought-after items or categories of item during the early colonial period was spices. Much of the initial exploration, be it transatlantic or south around the African Cape, was to find sea routes to the spice markets of Asia. There was big money in this. The economies of nations were largely founded on the spice market and revolved around the nation's dinner tables. But of course, there was a very dark side to this expansion as well. Another of the markets that was vital to the early colonial endeavor was the slave market. This was the age when the transatlantic slave trade, the triangular trade, came into being. And what I mean by triangular trade, which is how it was referred to, is this. There's no profit in sailing an empty ship. Anybody who has truckers in their family, for example, knows that no trucker likes to haul an empty truck. You want to have cargo. So the triangular trade was set up to make sure that ships were never sailing empty. So say you're starting from England, and England was, of all nations, in the long run the nation that got the most wealth out of the slave trade. Liverpool was the busiest port in the triangular trade in the world for a long time. So let's say a ship leaves Liverpool. It will leave with manufactured goods, goods made in England. It sails then down to the west coast of sub-Saharan Africa, where it offloads its cargo of manufactured goods in exchange for human beings. These human beings are packed in as tightly as they can possibly be packed in the holds of the ships, and then sailed across the Atlantic to the colonies in the Americas. And this, of course, includes the Caribbean as well. There, the human cargo was offloaded, and what's loaded onto the ships are things that are wanted back in England. Wood, fish, furs, you name it. And then the ship sails back to Liverpool, offloads its cargo from the colonies, takes on another load of manufactured goods, and repeats the process. And speaking of manufactured goods, colonial empires were not open markets. The colonies could only buy things manufactured within the empire, which basically meant in the home country. So the colonies provided the raw materials, which were sent back to England, for example, made into something new, that is, value added, and then shipped back to the colonies, of course, to be sold at a profit. Meanwhile, products from rival countries and rival empires were simply not sold within the bounds of any given colonial empire, for the most part. And speaking of people and markets and where to put things... Having a global empire gives you a place to put the extra people from a suddenly expanding population, and also people you never were terribly fond of, criminals, religious fanatics, Scots, Irish. So a number of the early settlers of North America and the unwilling settlers of Australia were actually people who were not wanted back home, who were in many cases forcibly shipped off, I'm thinking largely of the Highland clearances in Scotland here, in which the majority of the Highland population was actually exported forcibly to mostly North America. I'm also thinking of the punitive measure of transportation, that is one of the common penalties for numerous crimes, often relatively minor crimes, involved being sent out to the colonies, either North America or latterly Australia. And this resulted in huge population emigration, forced emigration, and was ultimately really transformative to the way the British Empire developed. But moving away from questions explicitly associated with wealth and economics, there's also the question of geopolitics. One of these is the control of transportation routes. England, or latterly Britain, took control of Jamaica in 1655, giving them their most durable stronghold in the Caribbean. 
Gibraltar in 1704, giving them control over the Straits of Gibraltar and thus the passage between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Malta in 1813, which gave them effective naval control over the central and western Mediterranean. And the Suez Canal, whose building they oversaw and which was completed in 1882, allowing a sea connection between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea thus allowing ships routed for Asia from the Atlantic, or vice versa, to not have to sail all around Africa. With control over the Mediterranean trade route, Britain ended up with tremendous power. And if you want an indication of how important this route was to them, when they were embroiled in the American Revolutionary War, they were also fighting the Spanish who had besieged Gibraltar and were bent on taking it back. The British didn't have enough forces to defend both their American colonies and their colony at Gibraltar. So while they continued to try to hold on to the 13 colonies, they made the long-term strategic decision to prioritize that little chunk of rock that guarded the entrance to the Mediterranean, recognizing that holding on to this was more in their long-term interest than holding on to the colonies that would eventually become the United States. Of course, once you have a foothold in a particular area, especially if you're very well armed, you suddenly have the ability to influence countries in various locations. If a huge British naval base is not too far away from where you happen to live, well, you're going to be careful about the policy decisions you make insofar as they relate to British interests, aren't you? At least if you have a good survival instinct, you will. And I'm not picking on the British here, we're simply talking about the spread of English, which obviously is a British concern. This is one of the ways empires work. Once they're in the area, they influence the entire area. And of course, do their best to make sure they influence the area to their advantage. Generally, of course, with no consideration of the well-being of the people or peoples who happen to have been there before them. And as I said, the empire game is very competitive. You're never the only one playing, so if you don't set up a base in a given location, you can simply take it for granted that somebody else will if given the opportunity. So you need to not only secure your own interests relative to the colonized population and your own population, you also need to worry about all of those other countries trying to do the same thing at your expense. That is, as I said, once this game gets going, it follows its own logic and becomes very big very fast. Because the alternative is to be outstripped by a competitor and thus face a genuine challenge to your existence. To this end, having a base from which to harass your competitors' ships is certainly a good idea. The British went about this in a couple of different ways, and they weren't the only ones. The obvious way of doing this is having a really good navy, which the British managed to do, having the best navy in the world for quite some time. But another strategy they used was to employ privateers. A privateer is this. The captain of a particular ship, which is not a naval vessel, it's a private ship, will hold what's called a letter of mark issued by the government. The letter of mark gives that captain and crew the right to attack and pillage the ships sailing under the flag of a competing nation. In the Caribbean, the most common object of privateer aggression was, of course, Spain. So when we move into the colonization and the spread of particularly British influence in the Caribbean, we also move into the golden age of piracy. Now, of course, not all pirates were privateers. Many of them had no interest in working for the government. In any case, that's the historical moment we're actually in right now. But of course it would be incomplete and dishonest of me not to mention the religious impulse as well, and the assumption on the part of the European powers that theirs was the highest civilization and that they were bringing the light of salvation to the savages, for instance. This provided, of course, a veneer of benevolence with mass public appeal back in the home countries, allowing or encouraging people to go off and 
undermine and systematically destroy indigenous cultures under the self-congratulatory illusion that they were actually doing them some good. And some people did genuinely believe they were doing good, or at least made a show of believing as much. This impulse towards civilizing the savages, a phrase I of course utter in implied quotation marks, is best summed up in the term coined by novelist, poet, and imperial cheerleader Rudyard Kipling, white man's burden. That is, there was a rhetorical move by which the colonizing powers, and we'll stick to Britain for now because that's our main focus, were able to convince themselves, or at least allow themselves to be convinced, that acting in their own self-interest with the religious veneer was actually for the good of the people and peoples whom they were destroying. White man's burden is, in a sense, a form of what I call mental colonization, even if the people themselves or peoples themselves are left above ground. What the imposition of this colonizer's religion does is take all of the categories of thought that are part of their own traditions and displace them with an invading tradition, very much in the way that a virus displaces the mechanisms in an infected cell and thus insinuate a foreign authority into the very heart and very heads of the peoples dominated in that particular way. It teaches them that they can't trust their own categories of thought, but must rely on foreign categories of thought, and people trained in those foreign categories of thought, to interpret their own lives. Of course, the first example that will spring probably to most of your minds is the residential school system in Canada, and that is a really, really good example. But of course, it wasn't just in the so-called New World where this happened. White man's burden, quote-unquote, was also a driving force in the colonization of Africa and India, to say nothing of New Zealand and Australia. And even when they encountered a highly literate culture with a religious and philosophic tradition stretching back not just before the so-called Common Era into years formerly measured in B.C., but stretching back to a period, as is the case with India, when not only did the English not exist, but the Germanic peoples as a whole didn't exist. They had not yet had their ethnogenesis, when the mythologies and philosophies that would coalesce into Hinduism were taking shape. And in case you're curious, in terms of theological literatures, the largest body of theological literature in the world is Hindu. But as I don't consider myself an authority on this subject, I'll just turn it over to somebody who is. Gandhi, who once, when returning from England, was asked by a reporter, what do you think of Western civilization? To which Gandhi quipped, I think it would be a very good idea. And if I can digress a moment into a personal story that does touch upon the mental processes involved in these colonizing impulses, I often look back on a guy I knew in Toronto in the late 80s. His name was Liam. Liam was Scottish. And he had spent some years in the British Army, for part of which he was stationed in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. While he was there, he became very disillusioned with much of the British colonial impulse that he was actually there to enforce, and he was there with a Scottish regiment. The Scottish and Irish, of course, have a lot of common ground. And I remember him saying to me how much he came to hate what he had to do over there. In his words, they were our brothers, but we had to kill them. And yet at the same time, if you got Liam talking about India, he was often baffled by the degree of dislike, the degree of outright antipathy directed by many Indians against the British. And again, if I can quote him, they hate us. We civilized them, but they hate us. And these two lines from Liam sum up, I think, really well the underlying cognitive dissonance often embroiled in that ideological impulse where colonialism is concerned. He was able to recognize commonality with the Irish, because the Irish and Scottish are so close, and hey, they're both white. But where this more foreign culture and much older culture was concerned, he didn't recognize any of the value of their own civilization and was genuinely confused why the people of India didn't gratefully accept the so-called gifts that white man's burden imposed upon them. This cognitive dissonance 
is interesting, and I think pondering it is always, always a useful endeavor, especially for people who are still committed to one or another of the colonizing ideologies. Now, if you want a good passage from the early modern period that sums up much of what I've been saying in terms of reasons or impulses behind the colonial endeavor, take a look at the Richard Hacklett passage in chapter 7 of your textbook. In his discussion of this passage, Gramley highlights four what he calls major criteria that Hacklett addresses, religious, political, economic, and technical geographic. So here's what I'd like you to do, just for your own edification, and maybe we can talk about this a bit on Friday. Read through the Hacklett passage, and whenever you encounter a religious justification, put an R beside that passage. For political justifications, put a P. For economic justifications, of course, an E. And for technical geographic justifications, say maybe a T slash G. Now, sometimes a passage will fit into more than one category. That's fine. In any case, read through that passage and see what picture emerges just as you categorize the various rationales that Hacklett gives for establishing colonies in other people's lands. But that's enough about the rationales for colonization for now. I think it's time we maybe take a look at the project itself. Here's a list of early British colonies in North America. I'm not going to read all of them, of course. I'll be providing a separate copy of the PowerPoint. But some of them are, I think, worth drawing attention to. The English established their first North American colony at St. John's in Newfoundland in 1520. Initially, that was just a seasonal colony. People didn't stay there year-round. They stayed during the fishing season. But it was chartered in 1583. Throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, of course, the British were practicing all of their colonial techniques on the Irish, exerting draconian controls over the economy, which of course would result in mass starvation, displacing many people, particularly the people of Ulster, with Protestant Scots, giving us the continued divisions between what is now Northern Ireland and what is the Republic of Ireland. Northern Ireland is all but two counties of Ulster. And the English of Ulster, referred to as Ulster Scots, is quite distinct from the English of the rest of Ireland. They established a colony on Bermuda in 1609. Of course, we have the, the, the famous pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock in 1620. And moving down the list, over the next less than 100 years, we see the colonization of much of both the Caribbean and the American Eastern Seaboard. Worth noting here is that the last colony on the list is Nova Scotia, not established until 1713, but I will just let you look over this list on your own time. When we turn to the general vicinity of India, the situation looks something like this. The English East India Company was established in 1601, later becoming the British East India Company after the Act of Union between England and Scotland in 1707. The British were in competition with the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the French, as well as, of course, indigenous resistance, as you would expect. But by 1757, the British East India Company had secured direct rule over much of the Indian subcontinent. That is, India was for 101 years, from 1757 to 1858, ruled not even directly by the crown, but by a corporation. In 1858, in response to the British East India Company's poor handling of an uprising, the crown took over direct government of India, and we enter there a period known as the Raj, which lasted until 1947, when the British withdrew. The presence of the British in India was very different from the presence of the British in, say, North America. It was largely military, administrative, and commercial, but did not involve the kind of mass settlement that we see in this part of the world, or, for example, in places like Australia and New Zealand. It was through their contact with India that the English picked up their world-famous fondness for tea. Continuing our quick little overview, we'll shift now to Australia and New Zealand, which were claimed by the English captain James Cook 
in 1769 and 1770, respectively. Australia, in 1788, becomes a destination for both voluntary and involuntary settlers, that is, people who want to go there, and criminals sentenced by the British courts to transportation. Notice how much later the settlements of Australia and New Zealand are. This is important for the development of the Southern Hemisphere dialects in ways that I'll get to before too long. I mean, by 1769, 1770, the American colonists were about getting ready to get rid of the British. And by 1788, when full-scale colonization in Australia actually starts, the American colonies have already not only declared, but also secured their independence from the crown. One of the principal occupations in Australia was, of course, sheep ranching, which is very land intensive and, of course, therefore necessarily involved the dispossession of much of the indigenous population. When gold was discovered in the mid 19th century, that discovery prompted even more land grabs and even more displacements. As far as New Zealand is concerned, it was, although discovered first, settled later and settled both from Australia and directly from Britain, again with consequences for the local dialect. Where the colonization of Africa is concerned, this gets going a little later than in other places and is really an endeavor of the 19th century. The Dutch, of course, had established a presence at Cape Town in 1652 of the possession of which the British relieved them in 1806. But in any case, once the colonization of Africa got underway, it was effectively a rapid free-for-all where the European powers were concerned, so much so that by 1885, they were able to sit down at a table in Berlin and hammer out an agreement as to who ruled what part of Africa. And here is the map that they came up with. The orange bits are British, and next largest, of course, are the French bits being green. One thing you will notice is that virtually none of Africa by 1885 is actually under indigenous control. And of course, the peoples of Africa were not consulted in this partition. And this map, by the way, the way in which Africa was partitioned in 1885, has led directly to many of the social ills that Africa is experiencing to this day. Because those boundaries don't take into account the boundaries between ethnic groups. So ethnic groups are split. Similarly, ethnic groups with different or opposing interests are forced to dwell closer to each other than they really want. And what the European colonizers would often do is enlist one particular ethnic group as basically their enforcers, give them privileges, give them authority that other groups were denied, and then let them act more or less as, as a police force. The animosity arising from that particular setup is responsible for a number of genuine human tragedies in Africa, including the Rwandan genocide. Now, as long as we're on the topic of maps, I think I'll show you a few. Here's a map of the British Empire in 1763. 1763, of course, being when the Seven Years' War was concluded and the British secured control over much of North America from the French. You'll notice that at that time, the bulk of the empire is in eastern North America, with a significant but not huge colony in India, and some holdings, of course, in the Caribbean and along the coast of Central America, and, of course, Ireland. Now, if we skip ahead here to 1815, we see that, of course, those ungrateful American colonials have cast off their rightful British overlords and established their own country. But we also see that the British now control the entire eastern half of the continent of Australia and are seriously expanding their presence in India, as well as having established strongholds at the Cape in South Africa and between the Mediterranean and Red Seas. 
if we skip ahead a little more than another century, we see the British Empire at its peak in 1920. They're the red bits, the blue bits are French. There is, of course, Canada, as we all know, Australia, New Zealand, and a number of islands in that general area. The entire Indian subcontinent, and in fact, almost all land bordering on the Indian Ocean. You'll notice as well, there is by this time an unbroken north-south route stretching across Africa from the Mediterranean right down to the Cape. The first of these holdings to break away was, of course, Ireland, which established the Irish Free State in, I believe, 1923. In this sense, we see a nice illustration of the principle, first in, first out. Well, except for those pesky Americans. The British Empire, of course, formally dissolved in the 1950s to be replaced by the British Commonwealth, a voluntary association of nations centering around their common ties to the crown, but fully independent in and of themselves. As of 2010, this is what the Commonwealth looks like. I bring this up not just because it's a matter of history, but because, of course, in all Commonwealth or former Commonwealth countries, English is either the or one of the official languages. But of course, the British Empire has not been the only empire to use English as its primary language. It's been basically replaced by the American Empire, whose language, of course, is also English. And for the purposes of this course, that sequence of two English-speaking empires is vitally important for the rise of English as a global language, as an international language, not merely in countries where it's a native language, but also in countries where it's a cultivated language for political and economic purposes. So here's a picture of the American Empire. The Americans, of course, have over 800 military bases around the world in over 100 countries. So to not call that an empire would be truly disingenuous. And I am hoping that even if just for a single day, we will have a chance before this course is done to talk about international English, the ESL or EFL communities. Because this also is, in addition to being a fascinating story, linguistically important, not just now, but moving forward. But as long as we're talking about language as such, what does all of this that I've been babbling about for the last God knows how long have to do with the English language? Well, let's break it down. Where the British went, there were different roles that the English speakers played in the different areas where they colonized. Different roles equate to different impacts on the language. For example, in North America, Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand, they went as settlers. In the Caribbean, the East Indies, East Africa, and Queensland, they went as plantation owners or overseers. And in West Africa and Southeast Asia, they tended to go as traders. Well, sending people in as settlers involves mass movements of populations. Plantation owners, a little less so, and traders even less still. So let's take a very quick look at how these different roles affected both the language and the areas that they directly impacted. We'll go into more detail as the course progresses. We'll start with settlers. In areas where the British came as settlers, indigenous languages were gradually displaced and sometimes not so gradually. Many become extinct, all are marginalized, and many of those that are not extinct are currently endangered. Some First Nations languages in Canada, for example, are down to just a handful of living native speakers. If you're curious about this, and you should be, check out the link that I've provided on this slide. It's issued by the Government of Canada. These are official statistics. This is worth a few moments of your time. Other general linguistic tendencies in the settler states include the following. In all of these, English remains an official language, at least in places that have official languages. The United States actually doesn't, but English is their de facto official language. English also remains the first language of much or most of the populace in all of these places. 
that is, it's a majority language. And as you might expect, as time went by and ties to England itself weakened and in some cases were severed, different national standards emerge. We'll be taking a look at some of these before the end of term. As far as influences on these national standards and regional dialects, they do vary. One factor is the dialect of English that the initial English-speaking settlers spoke. And this isn't just a matter of where they came from, but of course, when they came, because English in England has never been static. There are also what we might just generally group as independent developments. What kind of activities were they engaged in? With whom did they come into contact? With whom did they trade? That kind of thing. And wherever English speakers went, they would encounter indigenous vocabulary elements, for example, and many of these are also absorbed into the various national standards and local dialects. If you want an example from Australia, I provided a link for that as well, so you will just be able to get a sense of what I'm talking about there. And it's here, I suppose, I should distinguish between standard English and general English. Standard English is very formal, in fact, in many ways an artificial dialect or set of dialects, whereas general English, more broadly speaking, includes standard English but also includes common and mutually comprehensible colloquialisms. So, for example, I don't have none, I ain't about to start now, you got no idea. These are not things you want to put in writing, or at least not in formal writing, but anyone who understands English with any degree of fluency, not necessarily even native speakers, is probably going to understand you when you say these things or things like this. So general English is not as formal as standard English, but is also much more broadly encompassing. General English is what most people actually speak. Standard English is what more educated people try to speak, that is, it's a cultivated dialect, and it is the dialect of much written communication. And as long as we're speaking broadly for a moment, there are, broadly speaking, three major global standards. There is British English, American English, and Southern Hemisphere English. We'll be talking about all three of these before we're done. These standards, of course, have more in common than they have separating them, but the things that separate them are actually quite interesting, and I do look forward to exploring them with you. As for the language as it develops in areas where English speakers were there as traders or overseers, I'll just address these together and then go into more detail as the course moves along, we see a number of interesting developments. One, here we get the importation of many new words, and there's quite a variety of categories to which these words can belong. Items traded for, obviously. Local environment, also maybe almost as obviously. And local social relations. This makes sense when the British overseers and traders have to deal with local hierarchies rather than imposing their own hierarchies on them, which they were free to do in the settler states because they outnumbered or effectively exterminated the indigenous populations and didn't have to take their own practices into account. In many of these places, English remains an official language and or a lingua franca, that is a trade language. Creoles tend to be common. A creole, as we talked about, I think in our first or second lecture, is a version of a language that is strongly influenced by other languages at, the, at both lexical and grammatical levels. There are a number of really interesting creoles, which have developed out of pigeons, of course, and we will be looking at a few of these. Particularly, I'd like to take a look at some Jamaican creole and at least one creole in the continental United States as opposed to with settler states in areas where the British were there as traders or overseers. Very often, English is not the first language of the majority. It may be the first language of a large minority, 
But of course, that's not the same as being the language of the majority. One of the reasons for this, of course, is that if you take a look at the areas where English or where English speakers came as settlers, these were places where, to put it bluntly, the majority of the indigenous population was killed off, largely by disease, largely because they did not have immunity to European diseases. If you take a look at the places where the English tended to go as administrators or traders, many of these are in Africa or Asia, that is, land masses contiguous with Europe and that had also developed immunities to the same diseases that Europeans carried. In these areas, bilingualism is more common than in settler states, and borrowings in both directions are therefore also more common. It makes sense if you've got two languages or more rattling around in one brain, there is more likely to be some cross-pollination. Now, as another way of looking at how the various settlement patterns affected the language, let's take a look at some words that come from various areas where the British colonized. We'll start with India. Here's a list, a modest list, of words that come into English out of India. So we'll run down. Avatar, bandana, bangle, bungalow, chintz, chutney, cot, curry, dinghy, dungarees, guru, jodhpurs, jungle, juggernaut, khaki, karma, mantra, nirvana, pajamas, pundit, shampoo, shawl, thug, veranda, and yoga. You'll notice as I ran through the list and... I read the whole thing off deliberately because I want these words present in your mind. These words cover a wide variety of areas of life, don't they? Avatar, for example, is a religious word. An avatar is a full incarnation of a particular god. So Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is an avatar of the god Vishnu. And a Hindu would simply take a look at the Jesus character in the Bible and say, fine, that's an avatar of Yahweh no big deal, what took you so long? But there are also words here associated with cuisine, with housing, with clothing, jodhpurs are basically horse riding pants, hygiene, and architecture. Quite a lot, really. Now, why don't we take a look at some words from Africa and see what we can see there? Well, let's see. We have banana, banjo, bongo, chigger, Chimpanzee, coffee, goober, which is another word for peanut, gumbo, jamboree, jambalaya, jumbo, mamba, mojo, mumbo jumbo, okra, safari, voodoo, yam, and zombie. There's a fairly good range of areas of life here as well, isn't there? But it's not quite the same. I mean, we have food words, banana, goober, coffee, jambalaya. We have animal words, chimpanzee, chigger. We have some musical words, banjo, bongo. But where we have religious or high culture words, the usage is different than it is in India. Take a look at mumbo jumbo. In English, mumbo jumbo is a derogatory. It's a pejorative. It's saying somebody is speaking nonsense. Somebody is speaking gibberish. Well, Mumbo Jumbo is, in its original context, the, inc the incantation that, for example, a shaman might speak at the beginning of a ritual. This is a serious word. This is a high culture word, but it's used differently. Give that a little bit of thought. We'll be coming back to it. When we turn to North America, where English speakers were there as settlers, we have, again, a different picture. Let's run through this list. Caribou, chipmunk, hickory, hominy which is the corn from which grits are made, by the way, and it's delicious. Moccasin, moose, muskeg, muskrat, opossum, pecan, pemmican, persimmon, pone, quahog, quonset hut, raccoon, skunk, squash, toboggan, and woodchuck. Well, what's missing here? There's a lot of animal words here, fair number of food words, a little bit of clothing. Hmm, curious. Well, Let's simplify things and do a little bit of color coding. Before we start, here's our key. Words indicating high culture, including religion but excluding music, will be given in light blue. Material culture, excluding food, 
will be given in red. Food words will be yellow, music words purple, words for the natural environment will be green, and words fitting into miscellaneous other categories will simply be white. These are my own categorizations, by the way, but I think for our purposes they are useful. So, let's go back to India. What do we have? Well, we have a whole lot of material culture words, don't we? That seems to be the biggest category. The next category down is high culture. We have avatar, guru, juggernaut, karma, mantra, nirvana, pundit, thug, yoga. Now, as for juggernaut and thug, those take some explaining. Juggernaut comes from a Hindi word, jagannath, meaning lord of the world, and in English, of course, refers to a very powerful or maybe even overpowering individual or institution. And thug comes from the Hindi word thagi, which in its original context would have been a member of the cult of Kali, who would befriend unwary travelers on the roads, earn their trust, and then, having earned their trust, kill them in their sleep and take all their stuff. So, lovely people, of course. Next down, we have food words with two, but of course, if we expanded the list, we'd have more of those. And we have one environment word, jungle. Fine. That's a small picture, but I think an interesting picture. What I find interesting about this is how many material culture words there are. But let's apply the same scheme to words coming out of Africa. Here, there are no material culture words. Now, this may simply be a selection bias because, as I said, this isn't a large list. But there are lots of food words, aren't there? Give some thought to why that might be. There are a few different reasons. I'm not going to tell you what they are right now, but I think you can probably come up with at least two off the top of your heads. Musical words also are proportionally well represented, whereas on the list from India, we didn't see any. There are, of course, some, but we just didn't happen to have some. Again, these are small lists, so selection bias may be a factor. What I find interesting in this one is the ways in which the high culture words have been transformed. Many or most of the high culture words we have coming out of India are not said disrespectfully. They're often watered down, but they're not said, I think, with an underlying sense of indicating something as being devalued. That is, their meanings, if not identical to their original meanings, are reasonably close in most cases. But as we saw with the example of mumbo jumbo, these tend to be less respectful in the case of African high culture words than they do in the case of Indian high culture words. They're more likely to be derogatory or slang. Why do you think that might be? I'm going to ask you that and I'm not going to tell you. I do want you thinking about it. You might even want to write a reflection about it. Who knows? When we turn to words coming out of indigenous North American languages, the picture changes again, doesn't it? There are no high culture words here whatsoever. A few material culture words, but mostly it's animals and food. So it would appear, at least from this very small sampling, that the pattern of overall language contact has a really interesting effect on the kinds of word that are likely to be imported into the language and even the ways in which those words are likely to be adapted or interpreted. And again, I'll ask you, why do you think that is? And yes, I think I would like to offer this as one option on your next reflection. Once I get it formulated, I will, by Friday, post the actual details. But I do want you thinking about the effect the settlement pattern or the language contact pattern has or had on the kinds of words that were likely to be imported in a given language contact situation. I think thinking about this will probably reveal a lot. And I think that wraps it up for today. Thank you very much. I hope you found this little historical sketch interesting. Much, if not most, of the rest of the course will be directed toward fleshing it out.
So if there are questions left hanging, and there probably should be, if there are things arising about which you find yourselves curious, and there probably should be, you should of course feel free to make suggestions yourselves if there's a particular area of interest that you want to make sure that we hit. In any case, thank you, bye for now, and we'll talk soon.